good morning everyone uh, welcome to this session of the um, program uh, we have uh, this session's speaker dr tejas kalilka from iser pune uh, i'm very very thankful that he accepted our invitation to speak and uh, now i hand over the session to uh, tejas tejas you may please start yeah yeah thank you ashish and thank you to the rest of the organizers for uh, inviting me for this it's a great opportunity so i want to talk about uh, algorithms to recognize knots and in particular a specific class of knots called hyperbolic knots so i'm going to first spend maybe like 20 minutes just talking about the algorithms that currently exist and then talk a little about some original work which i've done with my student shriram uh, so so let me start i'm going to start with a simple uh, uh, yeah so a simple uh, question so you just stare at this knot for a bit so this knot looks fairly complicated you know there is this whole tangle kind of a thing and the question is is this in fact a familiar knot can you recognize which this knot is okay now it looks very complicated so try to work at it for a bit see if this is in fact some knot that you already know some knot that you recognize okay so so just your slides are not moving Oh, they're not moving. I mean, sorry. I yeah, it it is the first one we are seeing. Yes, now it has moved. Yes. Okay, maybe okay. I won't do full screen then. Maybe I just keep it over here. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah. So let me start over here. Yeah. yeah. So sorry. Uh, some technical issues. So this is what I was uh, trying to uh, talk about. So uh, just look at this particular knot, and uh, the question is: Is this in fact some familiar knot that you are aware of? And it looks fairly complicated. But uh, if you sort of go through the series of diagrams. uh what what i've done over here is that you basically start out with uh, i don't know if you can can you see my pointers i'm just pointing at one of these strands and i'm moving this strand down under this strand over here so it's just you can see the strand uh, see my pointer right yes yes okay great thank you so this strand i've just moved it under this one so this is just a small local change i made to the diagram certainly the knot has not changed then i look at this strand and i slide it under this kind of region over here so i get something like that then i slide this piece under this one and i move it up then i twist this region so each of these diagrams i have not changed the knot i'm just changing the diagram of the knot slightly by some small local change and eventually i get to the simplest possible knot the unknot so the original knot which looked fairly complicated is in fact the simplest possible knot the unknot okay so this brings us to a fairly important and one of the most basic questions in knot theory when are two knots equivalent okay so if i just give you the diagram of two different knots can you even tell me whether the two knots two knot diagrams represent the same knot or they are different knots this is apparently a easy looking problem but it's one of the most basic and hard problems in um, knot theory how do you recognize two knots now before i get to recognition of knots i need to tell you what does it mean for two knots to be equivalent so we say that two knots k1 and k2 in s3 are equivalent if there is a homeomorphism of s3 Uh, which uh, takes k1 to k2 okay so if you don't like s3 just think of r3 our usual space and if there's a homeomorphism of r3 which sends one knot to another knot then i say that these two knots are the same and there's a theorem of gordon and luke which says that two knots are equivalent if and only if their complements are homeomorphic okay so which means that the question of equivalence of knots can be translated to the question of homeomorphism of three manifolds if i give you two different three manifolds in some way then can you determine whether the three manifolds are the same this problem ends up being similar to the problem of asking whether two knots are the same perhaps from their diagrams or some other description of the knot okay so i want to first talk a little about the algorithms that currently exist so this is uh, this yeah okay sorry yeah this is a this is a very classical topological approach to it called the haken hierarchy and i will talk a little about what i have written in this paragraph but before that maybe it's easier to explain with some pictures so i'm going to go one dimension down and talk about two manifolds which means i'm just going to talk about surfaces and on these surfaces i have these essential curves the blue curves over here and the red curve over here and i also have some essential arcs uh, which are these green arcs and by essential i simply mean that it does not bound a disk it is not a not a trivial curve in the fundamental group okay so it doesn't bound any disk on the surface 
Okay, so in dimension two, which is one dimension lower than what I really want to talk about, let's at least understand what I mean. So what I'm talking about is, suppose you look at this collection of curves, then what I can do is first I cut along, uh, first I cut along this red curve. Once I do that, then I end up with two punctured tori. I then cut along this green arc. Once I do that, I end up with two annuli. And then I cut up along these blue arcs and I end up with two disks. Okay, I've drawn them as squares, but essentially I end up with two two-dimensional disks. Now, something similar can be done in dimension three as well. So if you look at a knot complement, then it is Haken. In other words, there is this, there is exists some incompressible surface, some surface in this manifold M, which is injective at the fundamental group level. This is analogous to saying that my knot does not bound a disk. It's not a trivial knot. Similarly, the surface is not trivial in the sense that it is injective at the fundamental group level. So I have this, I have some surface F1. Now, my first step is I take M and I cut along F1. So I have M minus F1. This gives me a manifold M2. Okay, now in M2, again, there happens to be some uh, incompressible surface, this pi one injective surface, F2. So I again cut along F2. I end up with another manifold. I then cut along F3. I repeat this process. And eventually, in finitely many steps, I end up with three-dimensional balls, just as over here, I end up with two-dimensional disks. So you can always do this, that for the knot complement, you can start out with this special surface, this uh, pi one injective surface, you cut along it. Again, you get a pi one injective surface, you repeat this process, and in finitely many steps, you end up with three-dimensional balls. So this is what is known as the Hakean hierarchy. So how does this lead to an algorithm for recognition of three-dimensional manifolds. Okay, so I'm just going to give an outline here. So this is an example by the, in this paper by Lakindi where you have this knot phi one, and this is the first surface F one. This is the ciphered surface, and then you take a complement of this ciphered surface, and you have this these two disks which correspond to F two. And after cutting along this, you just end up with three-dimensional balls. So this is just an example. Okay, so how does this lead to an algorithm? So the first step in this algorithm is you fix a triangulation of the knot complement. So this M is a knot complement. It's the complement of this knot, what is outside the knot in R3 or in S3. And you first fix a topological triangulation tau. So this is the starting step. You just fix one triangulation. You break it up into tetrahedra. Now there is it exists this finite set of surfaces in this complement called these fundamental surfaces such that every pi one injective surface can be generated from this finite list of surfaces by linear combinations. So it's almost like a basis. Okay, so if you're over here, if you see, we're interested in this pi one injective surfaces, in some sense, these non-trivial surfaces. Okay, and every non-trivial surface can be generated from this finite collection of fundamental incompressible surfaces via linear combinations. So it's exactly like your basis of a module kind of a picture. And what do I mean by finite combination of surfaces? So if I have a surface F1 and I have a surface F2, and I look at two times F2, then I'm just going to take a parallel copy of F2. Okay, And when I say F1 plus two times F2, the surface I get is obtained by smoothening along the intersecting circles. So this point really corresponds to a circle of intersection. And I just smoothen along these circles of intersection, and I end up with a new surface called F1 plus two times F2. Okay. Of course, over here, it looks like there's a choice involved in uh, making this smoothening. But if you do this smoothening corresponding to a triangulation, then there is no choice involved. The triangulation forces you to make smoothening along only one, day, one way and not the other way. So when I say S is this summation Ni Fi, what I mean is you have this finite collection of surfaces Fi. You combine them together via this smoothening process, and every incompressible surface can be generated in this way. So this is the first step. Now, the way uh, uh, now this now this of course requires a proof, but there exists some number n which depends only on the triangulation, such that it's possible to get this Haken hierarchy, which means this collection of these FIs, where each of these uh, these uh, surfaces, these uh, surfaces in this hierarchy, are generated from this fixed collection FI. And if you look at these coefficients ni, all the nis are bounded by this fixed number n. Okay, so this is what I call a bounded hierarchy. So all the surfaces that you're going to cut along so that you can reduce it to a ball, all the surfaces are generated from this fixed list of FIs and the coefficients you have these NIs are also bounded by some fixed number n tau. So it's a number which depends only on the triangulation. 
Okay, so this requires, of course, a proof, which I'm omitting over here. Okay, so now how do we get to an algorithm? So the algorithm, the way it works is you start out with these two knots, kappa one, kappa two, and let mi be their complement in S3. We then choose a triangulation for M1 and M2. And then we fix this kind of a bounded hierarchy in tau two. So in we have tau one and tau two, the two triangulations of the complement of kappa one and kappa two. And then I fix this kind of a way of breaking up my manifold M2 into balls via these surfaces along a bounded hierarchy. Okay, so that's what my H2 is. And once I cut along this collection of surfaces, what I end up with is just a collection of balls, which means I basically get a cell decomposition of M2. Okay, so this let C2 be the cell decomposition determined by this H2. Now we take all the possible bounded hierarchies of M1. So remember your NIs are bounded by this number N. So if you look at this summation Ni Fi, this Fi is a finite collection. So if Ni also, they are all positive integers and if they are bounded, then this is also basically a finite collection of incompressible surfaces. Okay, so from this finite collection of incompressible surfaces, I have a finite, uh, finitely many possible bounded hierarchies. I list all of them and each of them determines the cell structure. And M1 is homeomorphic to M2 if and only if one of these cell structures is combinatorially isomorphic to C2. Okay, so this is basically the algorithm. Now, even in this outline, I understand looking at it for the first time, it looks fairly complicated. And in fact, this is an algorithm which is, which I would say is fairly difficult to implement. And in fact, this was first done by Haken long back in the mid 1900s. There was one case of surface bundles over the circle, which was completed by Hemion. And even then, basically, there were so many steps in this algorithm, and it's, it's a fairly involved uh, proof. So Matthew essentially wrote a whole book about this algorithm and also filled in some small gaps, So, which is why I'm calling it the Hake and Hemion Matthew algorithm. So as an algorithm, this is the classical topological algorithm for recognition of manifolds and therefore the equivalence of knots. But it is a very difficult algorithm to implement, and there are no known complexity bounds for such an algorithm. OK, so this is the topological approach. Now, the more simple approach, which is uh, pioneered by Coward and Lackenby, involves what are called Reitmeister moves. So if you go back to this picture over here, all these individual moves that you see with the diagram are what are called Reitmeister moves. So they are one of three possible kind of moves. You either take a strand, one part of the knot diagram, and you add a kink to it. So just make a turn around it. Or you take two parallel strands, and you slide one under the other. Okay, so that is this kind of an operation. Or you have like a, a two strands which cross each other and you have one in between and you just move this up. And clearly if I make these small changes to the diagram, my knot is not changing, right? If I take the original knot and just put a kink to it, the diagram changes, the knot does not change, okay? But the more interesting result is, the reason it is a theorem is that any two knot diagrams will represent the same knot if and only if they are related by such local changes. Okay, so the if and only if part is where, which makes it a theorem, the if part is an obvious statement, but the uh, improvement by Coward and Lackenby is the following. Let the D1 and D2 be diagrams for a knot in R3, and let M be the number of crossings that they have in total. Then D2 may be obtained from D1 by a sequence of at most N Reitmeister moves. And this N is a really large number. It is this two raised to two raised to two is this power of twos raised to m, which is the number of crossings. And the height of this tower itself is 10 raised to a million times m. OK, so on the one hand, it's great to get an explicit bound. You know, if you care about complexity theory, there is nothing better than an explicit runtime bound. On the other hand, you can clearly see, we, even if I put m equal to 1, this number is larger than what can be managed even by supercomputers today. OK, so in, this, in that sense, I, I won't call this a practical bound in any sense of the word, but it is great to have an explicit bound. OK, how does this give us an algorithm? for knot recognition. So what I would do is you have two different knot diagrams, D1 and D2. What I do is I start with D1. I keep D1 on one side and D2 on the other. I start with D1 and I make all possible diagrams I can get from D1 by at most n many moves. This n is something finite and there are only three possible right master moves. So therefore I end up with a large but finite list of diagrams on the left side, okay? Because there are only finitely many diagrams you can get from the given diagram by at most n many right master moves. So I get a large list on one side and I have this candidate D2 on the other side. 
Now, if any of D1 is the same as D2, just combinatorial, if they look exactly the same up to combinatorics, then the two diagrams clearly represent the same knot. And if there is, if there is no diagram over here, which is the same as D2, then these two knots actually are different. Okay, so once you get a bound on the number of right Meissner moves, it becomes an algorithm for knot recognition. So the, great, this is a very al algorithm which is simple to implement, but of course the computation bounds are huge. Okay, so it's a simple algorithm with explicit bounds, but huge computation bounds. So this is the second algorithm for knot recognition. I'm gonna talk about a third algorithm for knot recognition, which is uh, using the complement. So as I said, two knots are the same, if and only if their complements are homeomorphic three manifolds. If the manifolds are the same, the complements are the same. So just as you have Reidmeister moves, which relate not diagrams, for a three-dimensional manifold, you can always break it up into these tetrahedra and stick this, you can just take tetrahedra and stick them together like Lego bricks, and you end up with what's called a triangulation of the three-dimensional manifold. So if you have two three-dimensional manifolds, you can go uh, with two triangulations of the same three-dimensional manifold, you can go from one triangulation to the other triangulation by small local changes to the triangulation, just as you can go from one knot diagram to another knot diagram by these small local changes called Reidmeister moves. So if you have two different triangulations, there are four possible Packner moves. I can take one tetrahedra in this big triangulation and I split it into four small tetrahedra or the reverse operation where I have four tetrahedra which share a vertex. I combine it together to give me one big tetrahedra. So this is two, two, uh, two Packner moves, or I can have two tetrahedra which share a triangle and I split it into three tetrahedra which share an edge or the reverse operation. Okay, so what exactly these moves are don't matter, but the important thing is they are very small local changes that you're making to the triangulation. Okay, so the manifold is the same manifold, you're just making a small change to the triangulation of the manifold. And just as you have this bound on the number of Reidmeister moves, you similarly have a bound on the number of Packner moves needed to go from one triangulation of the manifold to a different triangulation of the same manifold. So let tau1 and tau2 be two triangulations of a knot complement, which have m1 and m2 many tetrahedra. Then tau1 and tau2 are related by a sequence of Packner moves. And the length of the sequence is again this large number. It is this bounded tower of exponentials. The height of this tower is two raised to 200 times the number of tetrahedra. So again, we basically have a simple algorithm and the algorithm would be similar to the previous one, where you start with this triangulation, look at all possible triangulations you can get from it by at most n Packner moves. If any of those triangulations are just combinatorially the same as tau2, then the two manifolds are the same. If none of them is the same as tau2, then the two manifolds are different. And once the manifolds are different, the knots are different, okay? Because the complements are the same, if and only if the knots are same. So it's a simple algorithm to implement, and it has explicit bounds, so that's great but the bounds are huge, okay? They're not really practical bounds in any sense of the word. Okay, so let's see now what else we can do. So I want to talk about a specific class of knots. Right now I've been talking about knots in general, just any, where a knot is just an embedding of S1 in S3 or in R3, but knots often have a lot more structure to them, okay? So the structure that I want to talk about is what is known as hyperbolic structure. So the complement of a knot, if you look at the complement of a knot in S3, the three-dimensional sphere, then to start out with S3 minus K is just a topological manifold. There is no more content to it. But in most cases, this topological manifold ends up having a really nice geometry, which is this geometry of constant minus one curvature called the hyperbolic geometry, okay? So which knots now have hyperbolic geometry? These are called the hyperbolic knots. So my first statement is that Generically, if you look at knots with small crossing numbers, then the knot will happen to be hyperbolic. Okay, and to make this precise, there's a survey paper, really nice survey paper by host Thistle, Thwaite, and Weeks, which looks at all the knots with less than 17 crossings. And this is a list of more than a million seven hundred thousand knots. Of all these knots, all of them are hyperbolic except for 32 of them, which are which happen to be torus or satellite knots. Okay. So in that sense, most knots happen to have this additional structure on the complement. You know, it took a start out with the complement is just a topological manifold, but it actually happens to have this hyperbolic geometry to it. So these are called hyperbolic knots. Okay, so what, what more can we say from the diagram? If my diagram is alternating, which means I start with an overcrossing, I then have an undercrossing, then an overcrossing. So if you trace the diagram, 
and you go from overcrossing to undercrossing to overcrossing, then it's called an alternating knot. And if you have a prime alternating knot, which is not one of the standard torus knots, then it happens to be hyperbolic. Okay, so in particular from the diagram also, you can determine if the knot is hyperbolic or not. And this is the most recent result by Futter and Purcell, which says that you take a knot diagram and you look at these kind of regions. These are regions which they call twist regions. And if each of the twist regions has at least six crossings, then again, the knot happens to be hyperbolic. Okay, so there are many theorems which tell you from the diagram, they confirm that from the diagram, you can say this knot is hyperbolic. And furthermore, we expect most knots to be hyperbolic. Okay, so these are the two things I want you to take away from this slide. And this is the main theorem we started out this whole business, the theorem of Thurston, which says that every knot is either a torus knot, satellite knot, or the hyperbolic knot. Okay, so the main takeaway from this slide is that most knots happen to be hyperbolic. Okay, so although they start out just being topological objects, there is actually some geometry involved in the complement of the knot. Okay, so from hence forth, we are going to focus only on uh, hyperbolic knots, so only on knots where the complement actually is a complete hyperbolic manifold, which means a manifold with a certain Riemannian metric, which gives it constant minus one curvature. Okay, so these are the knots I'm going to focus on. These are my hyperbolic knots. Okay, so now for hyperbolic manifolds, there is a really strong structure theorem by Mostow and Prasad called the Mostow Prasad rigidity, which says that two manifolds, complete hyperbolic manifolds, they are isometric, which means they have the same shape if and only if their fundamental groups are isomorphic. Okay, it's a really strong statement. So in particular, two homeomorphic manifolds happen to be isometric. Okay, so just topological properties give you geometric properties. That's the content of this theorem. So this is a really big, uh, really strong sort of foundational theorem uh, by Mosto and Prasad. And as a result of this theorem, asking whether the two not complements are homeomorphic is the same as asking whether their complements are isometric, which is the same as asking whether the complements have the same fundamental group. So I can translate the problem about equivalence of knots to a problem about when, when two groups are in fact isomorphic to each other. Okay, and Sela has this algorithm to decide whether two torsion-free subgroups of PSL2C are isomorphic. So the group of isometries of H3, the three, hyperbolic three space happened to be PSL2C, so all these fundamental groups over here happen to be discrete torsion-free subgroups of PSL2C. So Sela's theorem will tell me when these two are the same. And therefore, via Master Prasad, the two manifolds are isometric and in particular homeomorphic. And therefore, by Gordon Luke's theorem, the two knots are equivalent. Okay. Of course, the problem with Sela's algorithm is that it is basically what I would think of as a theoretical algorithm. The exercise was to show that an algorithm exists. So it's very difficult to implement. I don't see an implementation of it straight away. And clearly there are no known computational bounds. The way it's written down, it's not clear how you would even get computational bounds from this algorithm. Okay, so how do you practically work with hyperbolic knots? Clearly a lot of people work with hyperbolic knots. It's the bread and butter for so many people in hyperbolic knot theory. So the tool that is used in hyperbolic knot theory is this program called Snappy. Okay, it's this computer program which works with hyperbolic knots. And it's really good at distinguishing hyperbolic knots. So how does it work? So to talk about it, I'm going to talk a little about a canonical polyhedral decomposition. Okay, so this hyperbolic manifold that is there, this shape that is there, just as if you take a surface and you can break it up into triangles. Similarly, this uh, hyperbolic shape that you have, which is the complement of the knot, you can break it up into geometric ideal polyhedra. Okay, so let me just read this out. A geometric ideal polyhedral decomposition of the manifold is a realization of the manifold as a quotient of a collection of hyperbolic ideal polyhedra by phase pairing isometries. So what it means is, so over here in H3, just as in, uh, in R3, your uh, planes end up being this totally geodesic surfaces. Okay, so the planes are kind of like your, in some sense, the flattest possible surface that you have. Similarly, in H3, the hyperbolic three space, your totally geodesic surfaces, these flat surfaces end up being these vertical planes or they end up being hemispheres. Okay, so just as this kind, what I've drawn over here is a Euclidean geometric pyramid where all these sides are just flat triangles. The corresponding thing over here is this hyperbolic geometric ideal uh, uh, pyramid. This is not a tetrahedron, it's a pyramid. So if you can break up your hyperbolic manifold into such geometric pieces, like Lego bricks, but like with sides also, which are flat, and you can stick them together to get your whole geometric shape. 
Then we see it as a geometric ideal polyhedral decomposition of the manifold. And in particular, if all these polyhedra are tetrahedra, then we call it a geometric ideal triangulation of the manifold. Okay. Now, the reason I'm introducing geometric ideal polyhedral decomposition is because, as I said, I want to talk about how this software Snappy works. Okay. So the main ingredient which goes into Snappy's uh, recognition of knots is what is known as uh, this epstein penner decomposition. So this is by two mathematicians, Epstein and Penner, which says that every finite volume cusp hyperbolic three manifold, in particular things like the complement of a hyperbolic knot, they, there exists this nice way of breaking it up into a jigsaw, and which is a canonical one. So there is no choice involved. So there exists a canonical ideal polyhedral decomposition for any hyperbolic knot complement. Okay, this is the content of Epstein Penner's uh, theorem that there is a canonical, a choiceless way, kind of a natural way of coming up with this jigsaw puzzle kind of a way of breaking up your complement of the knot in S3. Okay, and this is just a recent result by Holland Purcell. In fact, I think it's still on the, in the archives that for every n there exists this constant Cn such that if k is a link in a twist reduced diagram with n twist regions and each of the twist regions has at least Cn crossings, then the complement has a geometric ideal triangulation. And this is just in the direction of this conjecture. So there's a conjecture, which is not yet proved, that every hyperbolic knot complement, of course, if it's hyperbolic knot, by definition, the complement has hyperbolic geometry. But it also has a geometric ideal triangulation. So you can actually break it up into geometric tetrahedra. Okay, so this nice flat tetrahedra. This is the conjecture, and it has been proved for a large class of knots and also for finite covers of knots that it is actually you can break it up into geometric ideal tetrahedra. Okay, so for if you assume that this, so this is what Snappy does. So the way Snappy uh, works is this Weeks algorithm, which starts out with this geometric ideal triangulation of the knot complement, and it tries to converge to this canonical decomposition given by Epstein and Penner. Okay, so the way the algorithm now works is you start out with two knots, and then the co computer tries to calculate a geometric ideal triangulation of the complement. And in practice, it always ends up with it. There is no guarantee it will, because this is still a conjecture. We don't know that you always have a geometric ideal triangulation. In practice, the software with just a few iterations, it ends up with a geometric ideal triangulation. It then runs Weeks algorithm, and it tries to end up with the epstein penner decomposition, the cell decomposition, which is this natural uh, decomposition. And then it just compares the two decompositions you get from the two knots. If they are the same, then the two knots are the same. If they are different, then the knots are different. So this has in fact been used to create a census of all cusp finite volume hyperbolic manifolds with at most nine hyperbolic tetrahedra, which consists of a list of over 75,000 manifolds. But there are some cases where it ends up being inconclusive. Okay, so if it tells you that two knots are the same, then of course you are guaranteed is certified as a proof that they are the same, the two knots. However, there are some cases, very few, but some cases where it is inconclusive. It doesn't give you any answer at all. Okay, so clearly this has no runtime bound because it's not always guaranteed to succeed. There are also some floating point errors which can be removed, but this also leads to a problem with the census because there are some duplications in the census. There's a paper by Benjamin Burton which uh, uh, gives you a pair of duplications, a, a fairly recent paper. So that there are some problems with floating point errors as well. Okay, so uh, let me summarize what we have. So let me just give you the set of algorithms that these are known algorithms. The first one was this Haken Hamion Metweaves algorithm. It sa starts out with a topological triangulation of the knot complement. And then it uses this concept of Haken hierarchy of cutting it up along these pi one injective surfaces. And then it reduces it to the problem of checking whether two cell decompositions are in fact the same. This is an algorithm which is difficult to implement and there are no known computation bound. Then we have this algorithm of power and open B, where you start out with uh, two knot diagrams, and then you have a bound on the number of Reidmeister moves needed to relate these two knot diagrams. So it's a very conceptually simple algorithm, but as we observe, the bound is huge. It, this is power, power of exponentials, so it's not really a practical bound, although it is an explicit bound. And in a similar vein, we have Mizutovic's algorithm. In fact, Mizutovic's proof is what goes into coward lacking bayes proof. So it's not surprising that you have a similar kind of bound. Again, you start out with topological triangulations of the knot complement, and then you get a bound in the number of Packner moves needed to relate to such triangulations. Conceptually, a very simple idea, and you have explicit bounds, but again, the bounds are massive. 
So it's not very practical. And then you have Sena's algorithm, which works with the fundamental groups and tries to see whether the fundamental groups are the same and then appeal to Moscow plus our rigidity. Uh, this is an algorithm which would be difficult to implement with no known computation bounds. And finally, you have uh, this uh, Kassin Manning Weeks algorithm. This is, in some sense, the most practical algorithm which is used by software like Snappy, but it's not guaranteed to always succeed. It happens to work in most cases, but it's not guaranteed to succeed. Uh, so, so there's a question uh, uh, to know. Okay, I don't think that's a question, but maybe just a comment. Okay, so uh, these are the list of algorithms that we currently have. Okay, so the question that we asked ourselves is, is there an algorithm for hyperbolic knot equivalence, which is both simple to implement, unlike the Haken Hemion algorithm, which are impossible to impl implement in some sense, and it should have an co explicit computation bound, which should be practical with modern day computers. And in the starting point over that we start out with is not a knot diagram, but a geometric triangulation of the knot complement. It is assumed that all hyperbolic knots have a geometric triangulation. And this is the first step that Snappy also does. It starts out with a knot diagram, quickly gets the geometric idea triangulation of it, not guaranteed to get it, conjecture to get it, but in practice always does. And then it runs Geek's algorithm. So we are starting with the geometric idea triangulations. And the question we ask ourselves is, is there a bound which is simple to implement and which is has practical computation bounds? Okay, so this is our result. This is with my student, Sriram. Let M be a complete orientable cusp hyperbolic three-dimensional manifold. Let tau one and tau two be geometric ideal triangulations of the manifold with at most M1 and M2 many tetrahedra. And all the dihedral angles, so the angles between the faces of the tetrahedra, all of them are at least theta naught. Then the number of Pachner moves needed to relate tau one and tau two is less than this constant times m raised to 6 divided by sine theta naught raised to 12m plus something. Okay, So this is an explicit bound, similar in nature to the previous algorithms. But in the previous algorithms, our bounds were this bounded towers of exponentials. Here we have something which is polynomial. It is just m raised to 6. So it's a significant drop in the bound. And uh, how would this lead to an algorithm? I kind of already spelled this out, but let me go over it again. So given geometric ideal triangulations, of, so I started with two knots, K1 and K2. Okay, I then look at the complement of these knots, and then I look at a geometric ideal triangulation of these complements. So these triangulations tau1 and tau2, and then I list all the triangulations that are at most this n many Pachner moves away from tau1. So I start out with this triangulation. I make these small local changes to triangulation to get new triangulations, and I can make at most n many such local changes. So I again get a large but finite list of triangulations. And then the claim is that the two knots are equivalent if and only if there is some uh, triangulation in this L, there should probably be a tau. There is some tau in L, which is combinatorially isomorphic to uh, tau 2. Okay, So in this list, if any of the triangulations is the same as the triangulation on the right side, then the two knots are the same. If none of them are the same, then the two knots are different. Okay, So you get this large finite list. Just compare the triangulation on both sides just combinatorially. If there is equivalence anywhere, then the knots are the same. If they're not equivalent at any point, then they are, they are in fact different. Okay, so if let me just follow up with this claim. Why is this claim true? If some triangulation in L is combinatorial isomorphic to tau2, then the two just the combinatorial isomorphism itself gives me a homeomorphism between the two complements of the manifolds. And then if the complement of the manifold is homeomorphic, then Gordon Luke's theorem says the two knots are in fact the same, they are equivalent. Conversely, if the two knots are the same, then the two complements by definition are equivalent. This is just the definition of knot equivalence. And then Moshe Prasad rigidity says there is in fact an isometry from M1 to M2. So this K1 is a triangulation of the complement of kappa 1. And H inverse of K2 is now a geometric ideal triangulation again of M1. And they still have only this M1 and M2 mini uh, tetrahedra. So by our theorem, they must be related by at most n many Pachner moves, which means this H inverse of K2 must be in this list L. Okay, so the so this is the reverse direction that if these two are the same, then this there is some K in L, which is combinatorially isomorphic to K2. So we've gotten this H inverse K2 in L, which is in fact combinatorially isomorphic via H2 to K2. Okay, so this is the algorithm that you basically we get a bound in the number of Pachner moves needed to relate the geometric ideal triangulations of the knot complement 
and this bound is uh, significantly better than the bounded tower or exponential. It's a little more practical bound because it happens to be polynomial. Okay, so this is the main uh, theorem that I wanted to talk about. I want to quickly go over the proof. I know many people might blank out with the proof, but I thought if, we, if I have one hour, then maybe at least 15 minutes I should spend on talking about the proof. So I'm going to give you a very brief outline of the ideas which go into the proof of this theorem. So there are, I would break up the proof into two parts. The first part is where you want to get a common geometric subdivision. So remember, we start off with two triangulations. We have tau one and tau two. These are two geometric ideal triangulations of the knot complements. Okay, so I take two knots, I just draw two knots, I look at the complement in S3, I triangulate both sides and assume this triangulation has flat, really nice tetrahedra, which are all hyper hyperbolic, so they're all geometric tetrahedra, not topological tetrahedra. So tau 1 and tau 2 are geometric ideal triangulations with the same manifold and the dihedral angle, the angle between the faces is at least theta naught. Then the first step is to get a common subdivision. So if I just overlap, so I have these blue triangles and the red triangles, if I just overlap them together, I get some uh, common geometric polyhedral subdivision. And now if I take a barycentric subdivision of this, I just take the barycentrically subdivide this, then I get a common uh, uh, subdivision of both tau 1 and tau 2. So the first step now is to get a bound on the number of such polyhedra in this common subdivision. So find a bound on the number of polytopes in tau 1 intersection tau 2. The main idea which goes into this is something called Margulis lemma, which gives a thick, thin decomposition for the hyperbolic manifold. I'll come to it in a bit, but that's just telling, telling you the main idea which goes into it. The second part of the proof is more combinatorial, where, so now what I have is I look at tau 1 intersection tau 2, I got this kind of a subdivision. I took a barycentric subdivision of that, which gave me an actual simplicial subdivision. And then instead of going from tau 1 to tau 2, my aim is to go from tau 1 to this common subdivision, tau 2 to this common subdivision. And because these uh, processes are reversible, I can go from tau 1 to tau 2 by this bounded number of moves. Okay, so the second step now is to not go from tau 1 to tau 2, but to go from tau 1 to some subdivision of tau 2, or, sorry, some subdivision of tau 1, where I know the number of simplices here and I know the number of simplices over here. Okay, so starting with tau 1, I'm going to go to some subdivision of tau 1. That's the second step by a bounded number of moves. Okay, so let me talk a little about the first step, which is geometric, and the second step is combinatorial. So the first step is to get a bound on the number of these kind of common subdivisions. Now, this is not a trivial statement, so I just want to give you an example. What I have over here is a topological ideal triangulation. This is not uh, geometric, so I have this geometric triangle over here, and I just look at all these points that you see, this vertex, this vertex, and there's actually a vertex. This doesn't look like a triangle, but there's actually a vertex at infinity. So these parallel lines actually meet up at infinity, and that gives you a triangle over here. All these three vertices are at the infinity of this surface, the cusp of this surface. So this weird looking shape over here is actually the same triangle, but I put it over here on the surface. This is what the geometric ideal triangles look like. Now, if I have two such topological triangles, so let's take I have this blue triangle coming from tau 1, mm -hmm. and I have a red triangle, which comes from tau 2. And I want to see how many times do they intersect. So this tau 2, this red triangle that I've drawn over here, it is winding around this handle just once, but it could wind around n number of times. Right? And, and for every winding, I'm creating a new uh, cell in this common subdivision. Okay, So it is not obvious at all that tau 1 intersection tau 2 will have a bound on the number of such subdivision, such, such cells. Fortunately, we are not working with topological triangulations. We are actually working with geometric triangulations. So the geometry plays a role. And you can see that this kind of winding, which goes arbitrarily large, cannot actually happen. So this is where this notion of uh, Margulis lemma comes in. Okay, this may be a little rushed for people who are seeing it for the first time, but this is just a heuristic one dimension lower. What it says is you there is some universal constant epsilon such that if you look at the set of points on this surface, I'm talking in dimension two, where the injectivity radius is less than epsilon. So you're looking at regions which are flat. So over here, if I take, choose a point, there is this large disk over here, which is flat in the sense that it is homeomorphic to this. Uh, flat disk in R2. If I take a point over here and I take a very large disk, then the disk kind of meets itself and then it no longer is a disk, it actually becomes an annulus. So it's not homeomorphic to a disk. So there is, if you fix, so there is this fixed epsilon such that if you look at the points where this disk is of radius less than epsilon, where these, these are kind of these narrow points, then they are of this locus of such points 
are of two kinds. Either they are these kind of tubes around short geodesics, or they are part of this cusp. So you have this torus. This actually looks like a circle, but one dimension up, this is a torus. You have a torus cross R. So those are the two kinds of uh, spaces that you get, uh, subspaces that you get, which are the thin regions. So this is what's called the thin region, the blue part, and the rest of it is called the thick region. So this Margulis lemma is also uh, gives us what's called a thick, thin decomposition of the manifold. The thick region where you have these balls and the thin regions, which are these tubes around short geodesics and these uh, tubes at infinity, which are these cusp regions. So this is the Margulis lemma. So the way we use it is, you look at H3, the hyperbolic three space. I've drawn H2, of course, but I, because I can't draw H3 neatly. So this is a three-dimensional space over here, half space. And then using the thick thing decomposition, we find a cusp torus. This is a cusp torus, which is on that surface, which is deep enough, or in this case, high enough, so that it only meets the vertical simplices. So these are all vertical planes. So it does not meet these kind of things, these, or, or these hemispheres, it does not meet. It only meets the vertical simplices. Now, if it meets only the vertical simplices, then it will store us over here. If you look at the induced triangulation, the induced triangulation of these vertical planes along with this flat torus gives me just straight lines. And so I actually get a usual Euclidean triangulation of the flat torus. So it's a Euclidean geometric triangulation of the flat torus over here. This is my torus. So this torus actually you should think of as this region over here. This is my torus and it actually gets this induced triangulation which is just this flat triangulation, which is made up of the actual triangles, you know, these Euclidean triangles. And by some normalization, we can ensure that the shortest closed geodesic in this Euclidean metric is of unit length, and the area is also bounded in terms of the volume of the manifold. So what we end up with is a Euclidean triangulation of a flat torus with a bounded area. And because the dihedral angles between these faces, so these faces have this angle which is less than, which is uh, at least theta naught, so more than equal to theta naught. So the corresponding intersections over here give you triangles with angles greater than theta naught. And then using some combinatorics, we can calculate a lower bound on the edge lengths of this triangulation. Okay, so the vertices of this uh, triangulation are some minimum distance apart. And remember the vertices over here correspond to this whole geodesic. This whole geodesic is the edge of the original simplex, which intersect this in just a single point. So if I have a minimum distance between vertices, then I can get a minimum distance between the edges in the thick part. So this is the second thing, uh, the third step. As the vertices of the triangulation on the flat torus are a certain minimum distance apart, so we can find a lower distance bound between the edges of this tetrahedra in the thick part of the manifold. Once you have a lower bound, you have some spacing between the edges, then you can uh, uh, look at, so all the edges are a minimum distance apart. So I fix one tetrahedra of tau two, and I look at how all the edges of tau one intersect that one fixed tetrahedra. Okay, so one edge might intersect this triangle several times. That was the problem, right? But if it intersected several times, all these different pieces are some minimum distance apart, which means I can take these small balls around these edges, of a fixed radius. And then the volume of the whole tetrahedra is bounded by the vo volume of a regular ideal tetrahedra. This is again a uh, nature of hyperbolic geometry that you cannot have this arbitrarily large tetrahedra in terms of area. All of them are bounded by the volume of a regular ideal tetrahedra. So because the volume of this triangle is fixed and all these edges are at this minimum distance apart, I take these small balls around them and uh, these balls are all disjoint. So that some of the volumes of these balls should be less than the volume of the whole triangle. And this gives me a bound on the number of components of this E tau one intersection delta. This delta was a fixed tetrahedron in tau two. So I can vary my delta. And all the polytopes of tau one intersection delta contain an edge which lies either in an edge of tau one or of delta. And for each edge, because angles between are at least theta naught, so there are at most two pi by theta naught many polytopes with share an edge. So if you go around it, each angle is at least theta naught. So the number of such polytopes with share an edge is at most two pi by theta naught. And so I can vary my delta over all at tau two, and this gives a bound in the number of polytopes in tau one intersection tau two. I know this is a lot to take in in five minutes, but I just wanted to give a very brief outline. This is the first step of the proof. So this allows me to get a bound on so the first step over here. So I've got a bound on the number of such polytopes. Okay, so I can just take two triangulations, overlap them, and then the number of such polytopes that I get, I don't get into this kind of a situation where I have infinite binding, or at least unbounded binding. I have actually have a bound on the number of uh, polytopes in tau one intersection tau two. Okay, so this is the first step of the proof. 
next five minutes, I'm going to talk about the second step in this proof. The second step is how do I go from a triangulation to the to a subdivision of the triangulation? So now I'm not going from tau one to tau two. I've gotten this common subdivision, which is obtained by this tau one intersection tau two, and I have a bound in the number of simplices in this common subdivision. So my aim now is to go from just tau one to a subdivision of tau one in a bounded number of Packner moves. Okay, so this part is more combinatorial. So we want to, I claim this statement that let K be a Euclidean triangulation of a convex polytope and to go from a convex polytope to a cone over its boundary by a controlled number of Packner moves. So rather than talking about the whole triangulation, I'm just going to focus on one convex polytope, just one polytope. And I want to see how I can go from the polytope to the cone over its boundary. Okay, so this part is fairly combinatorial. So we say that a triangulated end ball is shellable. So this is a new property. I know in the last 10 minutes I'm introducing something new, but uh, yeah, let me just give you an outline. So we have this property of being shellable. So what does it mean to be shellable? So we say that a triangulation of this uh, uh, polytope is shellable. If you look at delta one, maybe I'll do it with this example over here. Okay, so this is not a shelling sequence. So shelling sequence means you take delta one, you see how it intersects nothing, where delta one is nothing. Look at how delta two intersects delta one, we should intersect it in a disk. See how delta three intersects delta one union delta two, we should intersect in a, uh, in a two dimensional disk. See how delta four intersects delta one unit delta two unit delta three, it should intersect in a two dimensional disk. So one dimension lower, I have my one, okay, there's no condition here, but now two should intersect one in a one dimensional disk. That is not happening over here, okay? Two does not intersect one, in a one-dimensional disk, so this is not a sharing sequence. The problem, of course, is just have labeled it in a bad way. If I label it in this way, then two intersects one in a, a one-dimensional disk, three intersects one union two in a one-dimensional disk, four intersects a union over here in a one-dimensional disk, so I'm good. This is actually a sharing sequence. One dimension up, let's see this in action. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This, in fact, is a sharing sequence for this convex polytope. And remember, our aim is to go from this polytope to a cone over its boundary by a controlled number of Packner moves. Now, if my triangulation is shellable, it has this nice property that you can enumerate it in this way that three intersects one unit two, four intersects one unit two and three, five intersects one, two, three, four in just a disk. If that property is there, then I can convert this to a sequence of Packner moves. The way I do it is you start with one, Okay, and then I do this one, three Packner move, a small local change to the triangulation. I then look at the next one, two, I again make a small change. I make a small change. And then I have five, which intersects one unit, two unit, three. Again, this, this whole thing is a disk. So I make a three, one Packner move. So I can continue this process and eventually end up with a cone over its boundary. Okay, so this is the boundary and I've just taken a point and I've coned it over the boundary. So starting out with the original triangulation, by as many Packner moves as there were triangles, I have gone to the cone over its boundary. Okay, so the question is when, so if I have this kind of a shellable property, then I can do this operation of going from the polytope to the cone over its boundary by a controlled number of Packner moves. So the question is when does this kind of a triangulation of a convex polytope have this property of being shellable? Now, this property of being shellable seemed so obvious that when I saw it for the first time, I thought, Every convex free polytope, every triangulation should obviously be shellable. But there are examples way back in the 50s where Rudin has given a Euclidean triangulation of a three dimensional tetrahedron, just the usual three dimensional tetrahedron that you imagine, which is not shellable. And then Likarish has a whole family of infinity mean examples of S3 where you have triangulations which are not shellable. So even in the simplest of cases, you actually might have triangulations which are not shellable. Okay, so we were kind of stymied over here. Fortunately, in 2018, there's this new result by Adi Prasito and Benedetti, who show that if you have a Euclidean subdivision of a convex three-dimensional polytope, actually 2018, they put it up on the archives. I think it's a much later result when it was published. So if you have any subdivision of a convex three-dimensional polytope, then its barycentric subdivision is actually shellable. So even though the original triangulation is not shellable, just by taking one barycentric subdivision, it actually gets this property of shellability. So if you have shellability, then we're good. We can go from a, a convex polytope to the cone over its boundary. Okay, so how does that help us? So if you start out with the subdivision, so we, there is this triangulation tau, I want to go to its subdivision tau star. Okay, how do I go from tau to tau star using this idea of starting out with a convex polytope and a shellable triangulation and, and coning over its boundary? 
So if you just see the picture over here, so I have my original triangulation, which is in red. I have a subdivision of it, which is in, which is this tau star in black. Okay. Now I want to go from tau star to tau by a controlled number of Pachner moves. Okay. So what I do is I first take this original triangle and I take the star of the simplex, which means I take all the simplices which contain this whole triangle. Now there are no simplices which contain it except for itself. So basically I'm just looking at this and I'm, this is the convex polytope. And I'm going to change this to a cone over its boundary. So you see the points on the boundary. You have one, two, three, four points. I don't have this. This is a weird thing over here. But I just have points in the boundary. And I'm going to change it to a cone over its boundary. Okay. So the first step is to take all these two triangles all the, and, and just change it to the cone over its boundary. I then take the one-dimensional edges. The, the one-dimensional simplices, the edges. I look at the star of it. So I look at this region. So this region is a star of this edge. Okay, so this edge, look at all the simplices which contain this edge, which is this whole region. This is again some convex polytope. It's actually a hyperbolic polytope, but you can translate it to Euclidean polytope via some models. So you have this polytope over here. And I'm going to change this to a cone over its boundary. So the boundary is this thing over here. I change it to the cone over its boundary. Okay, so this region has now changed to the cone over its boundary. Similarly, for the stuff over here, I change it to the cone over its boundary. Now, when I do this, you see, this is a familiar picture. This is just a barycentric subdivision of the original triangulation. Okay, so I can go from tau star to the barycentric subdivision of the original triangulation by simply changing the star of each simplex to the cone over its boundary. And we can do this if the star of each simplex is a convex polytope with a shellable triangulation. And that's where this idea of Benedetti tells us that you can make it shellable by just taking one barycentric subdivision. So now all the ingredients are there. So we want to go from the star of this simplex to the cone over its boundary. And we can do that if it is shellable. Adi Presita Benedetti tells us that you can always take a subdivision and make it shellable. And then we go from uh, start with tau star. We take each of the simplices, as I saw in that picture, look at the star of it, change it to the cone over its boundary. Then you vary your A over all the dimensions of all the cells, do it inductively. And finally, you can get from tau star to the barycentric subdivision of the original triangulation by as many Pachner moves as there are three simplices over here. And by the first step, we know how many three simplices there are over here. Okay, we have bounded the number, number of three simplices over here. So we have a bound in the number of polytopes in this common subdivision, therefore a bound in the number of simplices in tau star and therefore in beta of tau star, which gives us a bound in the number of Pachner moves. So finally, to go from tau 1 to tau 2, we go from, we first of all get this common subdivision, we get a bound on this common subdivision, the number of simplices here, via this geometry idea of using the thick thin decomposition. And then we use the idea of shelling and adequacy to Benedetti's result, which allows us to use shelling to go from tau one to this common subdivision, tau two to this common subdivision, and therefore from tau one to tau two by a controlled number of Pachner moves. Okay, so this is the whole outline of the proof. I know it's a lot to take in, but maybe the slides will be put up somewhere and you can go back and have a look at it again. So this gives a algorithm to go from the original not kappa one to kappa two by looking at the complement. You triangulate the complement, and then you have a bound in the number of steps needed to go from one triangulation to the other triangulation, and uh, that allow, that gives us an algorithm for not recognition. Now the same ideas maybe in the last <clears throat> two minutes. The same ideas can also be used for closed manifolds to so recognize closed manifolds. So this is, uh, in fact, for closed manifolds we have a little more. So. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but basically I'll just say that for closed manifolds, you we also have it for spherical, Euclidean, and hyperbolic manifolds. You have a bound on the number of Pachner moves needed to go from one triangulation to the other. This is the exact bound, the function that you have on the number of Pachner moves needed to go, number of steps needed to go from one triangulation to the other triangulation in the case of closed constant curvature n-dimensional manifolds. So this is in any dimension. And it is for spherical, Euclidean, or hyperbolic n-dimensional manifolds. You have a bound in the number of moves needed to go from one triangulation to the other one. And in particular, if you focus on dimension three, which is what this whole talk has been about, then you basically, for the closed case, the compact case, you basically have this constant, and it is doubly exponential in the number of tetrahedra. And in the previous thing, we were looking at the dihedral angle. Here we have a bound in the number of, on the length of the edges, because these are all uh, these are not ideal triangles. The vertices are actually there. So you have a bound in the length of the edges. And using the bound in the length of the edges, we have something which is exponential in the number of tetrahedra, doubly exponential on the length of this thing. And you have this bound in front. So 
If you look at the original boundary measure topic, that is whole bounded tower of exponentials. So in dimension three, already this is better. And in dimension higher than three, there are no bounds at all. So I, this might be the first results that we have. For higher dimensional manifolds, you have a bound on the number of pattern moves needed to go from one triangulation to the other one. For geometric triangulations, in the spherical, Euclidean, and geometry, uh, hyperbolic world. Along the way, we also get a uh, bound in the systole length. So the systole is the length of the shortest closed geodesic. And we get a lower bound in the systole length, again, in terms of the dihedral angle and the number of tetrahedra. Okay, so this is again of interest more to geometers, not really for actually even for not theorists because of the fact that the systole length also ends up being a property of the hyperbolic knot via Monster Cluster rigidity. So the systole length is uh, studied a lot. This is the smallest curve that you can get, which is non trivial in some sense. So the length of that is the systole, and we have a lower bound in the systole length. This is in the same along using the same tools basically. Okay, so I think I, I'm, I'm done with my time. So I'll stop over here. These are references if you would like to go back and look at the paper. The first one is for the non compact, the cost hyperbolic situation. And this paper is my other student, Advait. This is in the uh, case for the compact situation for any n dimensional manifolds. Okay, so I'll stop over here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tejas. Uh, I think we can uh, take a few questions if there are any. Any May question? Ask, uh, one question. I uh, yeah. Is there some question. way to find uh, uh, the volume of uh, the hyperbolic knot. Uh, so the thing is for volume. Actually, this has been done already. So there is this paper by Lackenby, and in terms of the number of twist regions, there is this very nice, almost a bilipsis bilipsis kind of a bound for the volume of the knot complement, just in terms of the number of twist regions in the knot diagram. Uh, so, um, using this, it must be possible uh, in an easier way to say when two knots are not uh, uh, equivalent, right? Yes, yes, because volume is also a not not uh, invariant, obviously, because it is a geometric invariant and therefore to positive invariant. Geometric invariant, yeah. Yes. So, volume is a hyperbolic not invariant, yes. Uh, so, so uh, how does that uh, algorithm compare with uh, the... Uh, I mean, in terms of computational complexity and so on. No, is no, it... so the, yeah, so the point is the Lacanby's theorem gives us a range for the volume. It doesn't give us an I answer. see. Okay, okay. Got yeah. it. Okay. And within a range, you have lots of infinitely many possible knots, actually. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Any other question? Uh, so this is regarding the earlier part of the talk. Yeah. So how does the software like determine like a come up with a geometric ideal triangulation given a uh, given a knot? So you mentioned that was the first step, right? Yes, yes, yes. So how does the program come up with a, a yeah. geometric ideal triangulation? Yeah. So this is a good question. So as I said, you know, it is not guaranteed to do it because it is still a conjecture that you have a geometric ideal triangulation. But the way it works is the following. From the knot diagram, it is not hard. There are simple ways to come up with a topological triangulation, firstly. Just start out with the knot diagram, you know, just break it up into these lines and edges and so on. There is a, some standard way of breaking it up into a topological triangulation. Now, once you have a topological triangulation, you want to see whether this topological triangulation actually is geometric. And for that, there is a system of equations which are non-linear, but there are some linearized versions as well called the Thurston equations, Thurston gluing and completeness equations. So from a topological triangulation, the software tries to solve these Thurston gluing and completeness equations. If it solves it and you get a solution, then that means that your topological triangulation actually has a geometric version. There is a geometric ideal triangulation, which is just that particular topological triangulation. If it cannot solve it, then what it simply does is a pattern move, what I talked about. You slightly change the triangulation and try again. Okay, so it's kind of, you know, it might say that it's a hit and miss kind of an operation, but practically, it very quickly, in like literally in less than nine, 10 steps, it ends up with some topological triangulation where the Thurston equations can be solved. And therefore, that triangulation is actually geometric. So that's how it gets a geometric ideal triangulation. And a small follow up. And in that particular triangulation, what, what is the theta, the dihedral angles involved? Yeah, that will also come as part of the Thurston equations. The solutions of the Thurston equations will actually tell you the thetas. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the uh, uh, hyperbolic ideal uh, tetrahedras are determined by these values of theta. So actually, yes, if you tell me what are the three thetas, so there are six such edges, but actually three of them will completely determine it. Actually, two of them will determine it. So actually, the uh, solution will tell you what those thetas are. Also. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, any other question or comment? Yeah, so if there are no other questions, uh, we thank uh, Tejas for such a wonderful talk. And uh, it was very on a very short time request that he agreed to deliver this talk. Thank you very much, Tejas. Thank you.